I tried to respond in kind. I feared that she suffered more than I did. Kiel was under daily bombardment from the Allies, and I knew that she had to be hungry all the time because of wartime rationing. By contrast, I might have been worked like a slave, but I was fed, sheltered, and did not have to worry about any more bombs dropped on my head. By that fall, the Americans gave me the worst work detail imaginable. Field work. I was not cut out for it any more than I had been for soldiering. In Germany, I had been trained at a commercial college for a desk job in accounting and purchasing. Now I was planting onions over vast acres with Mexican migrant labourers under the hot Texas sun. The most gardening I had ever done was to help my mother plant a few tomatoes in her little garden. The Mexicans heading up the rows planted quickly and efficiently, one tiny onion plant at a time, all day long. Their planted rows were as straight and as even as grid work. The only way I could keep up was to throw whole bunches of baby onions in fewer holes. I hoped no one would be able to remember which rows were mine when the green shoots came up. But I pressed on, because I would get 80 cents a day in canteen coupons. After tying to keep up with the Mexicans for a week and suffering from nausea and headaches every night, I looked for easier work. Once again, God was with me. My chance arrived, an opening as a temporary translator for an American Sergeant Ruthrock. He was an overweight guy with eyes that almost disappeared in his puffy face. Ruthrock wore a big, brown hat that I learned was worn by drill instructors in the US Army. Ruthrock was in charge of the work assignments for the POWs. He took roll call and sent the POWs off to their daily work assignments. While he talked, he chewed snuff and spat. His drawled Texas vowels, interspersed with juicy hacks, sounded a lot different than my British English pronunciation. We could barely understand each other. In order to make sure he understood me, I tried to drop my British English and to speak American without realising I also picked up his colloquialisms. I said this away and that away and y'all and every other catchy word I heard him use. Up to this point, I had considered my knowledge of English an asset in surviving as a POW in America. Then a serious incident occurred regarding one of my barracks mates, 24-year-old CPL Hugo Kraus. Hugo also spoke English, and he occasionally translated for the camp commander. Hugo had lived in New York with his immigrant parents from 1928 to 1939. Then he returned to Germany, where he had felt more at home. He went to school to become a tailor and worked at that craft until he was drafted. Strange as it might seem, while Hugo was in the Africa Corps fighting the Allies, his parents became citizens of the United States. When Mr and Mrs Krauss learned Hugo had arrived in Hearn, they were ecstatic. Since Hugo was a German citizen and soldier, he was not given any special privileges, but his parents were allowed to visit him in camp. They brought him smiles, hugs and a sewing machine. My friend Hugo was thrilled with his gift and set himself up in business. Word quickly got around that Hugo could custom tailor uniforms, shirts and hats with his new American sewing machine. Our barracks soon had a steady stream of visitors who wanted their baggy army clothes transformed into sleekly fitted outfits. Then, one night after lights out, we awoke to a loud commotion. What's going on? I asked. I jumped out of bed and rushed over to the crowd around Hugo's bunk. He was bleeding and unconscious. What happened? I asked a man in a bunk near Hugo. Some guys threw a blanket over his head and beat him up with floorboards. It was over in minutes. I couldn't believe I had slept through all of that. Who were they? What did they look like? I asked. It was dark. He pointed to the door. They ran out that way and disappeared. I don't know who they were, the man said, shaking his head and averting his eyes. He went back to his cot and pulled his blanket over his head. Medics came running and took Hugo away on a stretcher. I never saw him again. The next morning they told us Hugo died in the hospital. Rumour had it that Hugo's death was reported as a murder by persons unknown. 
Rolf figured Hugo's American connections had looked treasonous to the Nazis. I was shocked to the marrow of my bones. His poor parents. They must have been devastated. A fanatic German paratrooper in the next barracks seemed the most likely suspect to me, but it was dangerous to even poke my nose into such matters. After the end of the war, I read that several German POWs were found guilty of Hugo's murder and hanged at Fort Leavenworth, Kansas. Hugo's murder made it clear that ardent Nazis were among us. It brought home the fact that I was in far more danger from my fellow Germans than from my American captors. Knights were the most dangerous, because the Americans did not guard our barracks. After Hugo's murder, I felt even more vulnerable, especially in bed. I could never relax. As if I were still in Africa, I slept lightly, alert to the faintest noise. So did my closest buddies. Since I had been a friend of Hugo's, I was terrified that the murderers would target me for that reason, or else because of my job as interpreter for the American military staff. I found Rolf the next morning and told him, I'm getting out of here. What? You're escaping? No, you idiot. I'm going to another camp. This I've to see with my own eyes. I managed to transfer to a POW camp in Mexia, Texas, with a few other POWs from Hearn. My choice did not turn out well. Turned out a German officer's camp was attached to the regular camp in Mexia. We barely got our bunks made up when German officers strutted into our barracks. We had to jump up quick to give them a snappy salute. Be at our barrack in an hour, one top-ranking officer said, coolly surveying us. A few of you will be chosen to be our valets. You will be required to launder our clothes and clean our rooms. Full of themselves, they sauntered out the door. My buddies and I looked at each other in amazement. I didn't come through the war just to become a servant, I said. Neither did I, said another newcomer. I say, we don't do it. Let's see them try to make us, someone shouted, pushing a bed against the door. Someone else threw a chair on the bed. Caught up in the moment, we used every available piece of furniture to barricade ourselves inside. An hour later, the officers came to see what was taking us so long. We pressed ourselves against the barricade. After a great deal of shoving, banging, cursing and shouting orders, the officers gave up and retreated. We gave each other the thumbs up sign. We were finally on a winning team. We laughed and shook hands. Mexia isn't going to be so bad after all, I said. I doubt those guys, officers or not, will risk looking foolish again. Our little group ambled over to the mess hall, thinking that we had won a minor skirmish. Our euphoric feeling didn't last. When we woke up the next morning, we learned that the officers had arranged a surprise for us. They got us kicked out of camp, herded on another train and seated in another Pullman car. I wondered what was going to happen next. Once again, I had no idea where I was headed or what would happen when I got there. I strengthened my resolve to take charge of my own survival. I heard from a guard that volunteers for the train's kitchen duty were needed. I jumped at the chance. Any action was better than no action. I tried to be optimistic. The train ride was a reprieve from barbed wire, watchtowers and unpredictable pools. I would think of it as a vacation. As it turned out, the train ride was all of that and more. As I peeled vegetables, the train window in front of me became a moving visual in my new education. I saw a part of America I never knew existed, fresh, clean and new compared to Europe. Each night, replete with a good meal, I would stay awake as long as possible to peer through the dark. Lights of towns, cities and farmhouses flashed by. With relative freedom, my fellow kitchen helpers and I were able to relax and to enjoy the fleeting days. The United States of America intrigued me. What amazed me most was that America had managed to flourish even in wartime. I would have been happy to stay on the train for the duration of the war. But my brief vacation came to an end when the train hissed to a stop in Fort Knox, Kentucky, in the spring of 1944. Back in the real world, harsh reality set in. 
I observed an enormous encampment that should have been called Army Metropolis. My small group was met at the train by guards who took us to an administration building. I struck up a conversation with one of the younger guards. He said that there was a POW camp inside Fort Knox that had been built for Italian Piaus. Then Italy changed sides from the Axis to the Allies. Now the Italians were no longer held captive, and they wore American uniforms with a badge, Italia. So, we got their compound. The guard showed me to the barracks where soldiers from northern Germany were said to bunk. I stuck my head in and introduced myself. The guys inside let me know I was in the right place. Two of the nicest and most helpful guys in my barracks were Siepel, Fritz Wolf and PFC Ernst Schlotter. Fritz was in his middle thirties. He came from Leipzig, home of the famous Messestadt, the World Trade Exhibition. A veteran with six years of army service, Fritz had served in an engineer battalion before being captured. Ernst was from Britheim and was around the same age as Fritz. He had served for more than five years and was trained on the new Nebelwerfer rocket projector before he was shipped to North Africa, where he waited for it to arrive. Both of them had served in France and Poland before being sent to Africa. I found a bunk near the ones Fritz and Ernst had staked out. Even though they were older and veterans of earlier campaigns in Poland and France, they were upbeat and positive about our situation. Like me, they just wanted peace and to go home to their families. Starting that first night, I ate my meals with them. Turned out they played scat, my favourite card game. We played soccer too. Soccer was unknown to Americans back then. Our nervous young guards stared in distaste as we bounced the ball off our feet and heads. All of the POWs had learned to ignore the guards. They knew nothing of our ways. What they saw they seemed to distrust and disparage. Little did we know how their fear and anger would change our lives. As the first 500 Germans in Fort Knox, we were assigned to post headquarters. My first job was in the post laundry. There, I met my first American civilians who worked for the US Army. I didn't have much in common with them. Most were older and married. They exchanged first names with me right away. Even with Germans of the same social class, it could take months or years to get on a first name basis. If the Germans were of a higher social class, they would never let someone like me call them by their first names. I liked the Americans' informal ways. The civilians' clothes were more casual too. Women seemed to have many changes of clothing and wore slacks, whereas German women usually had only two high-quality tailored suits per season. Although women on both sides of the Atlantic wore their hair in elaborate pompadours like Hollywood movie stars, Americans also differed because they wore makeup. Compacts were clicked open constantly when they touched up their faces. A romantic perfume in a blue bottle called Evening in Paris was daubed on all day. Their scent made me dizzy. Although I eventually relaxed and talked and joked with the married women, I was much too shy to speak to the few unmarried girls who worked there. Obviously underwhelmed, they did not seek me out either. Still, I was content to see soft feminine forms in colourful clothes again. For a whole year, all I had seen were uniforms. They played pop music on their radios. American civilians joined the POWs in singing and humming Don't Fence Me In, a Western ballad from the Hit Parade, a radio show in 1944. That song and Sentimental Journey, also popular at that time, are still my favourites. Life in a POW camp was full of paradoxes. From my barracks, I could observe a smaller prison camp down the hill that was used as a stockade to imprison and punish US Army soldiers. They wore the same uniform as ours, with a big P on the back and little blue hats. They came into our compound under heavy guard every day to empty our garbage. That certainly told them where they stood. By contrast, when my friends and I went out to work details inside Fort Knox, we had no guards at all. American soldiers who had violated US Army regulations were not fed as well as we were either. We felt sorry for them and sneaked them candy sometimes. The American prisoners were soon transferred elsewhere, 
and their old camp became a branch camp to ours. Except for occasional lapses into a little mischief like giving away candy bars, we followed the rules, kept to the schedules, and felt pretty secure. Camp life settled into a routine. Before long, Fritz, Ernst and Pretty, secure we needed die gemütlichkeit, and formed a gentleman's club. We saved raisins from the mess hall to make our own wine by fermenting raisins, yeast and water in a gallon jar with holes in the top. A rather potent wine resulted. To raise our spirits, we served each other our homemade spirits with encouraging toasts to the future. Unfortunately, the calm did not last. After the Allied invasion of Normandy in June 1944, large contingents of POWs began to arrive in the United States. Many ended up at Fort Knox. A lot of them were die-hard Nazis. Worse than that, German Waffen SS, Hitler's special forces captured in France, arrived too. The SS were always ready to instigate a fight over allegiance, with no holds barred. All anyone talked about was Hitler, the Nazis, and the outcome of the war. Arguments and fights were common. Life inside the camp suddenly became hazardous to men like me, who wanted nothing but peace and to go home to help our families. Other newly arrived soldiers brought both of them had served in France and Poland before being sent to Africa. I found a bunk near the ones Fritz and Ernst had staked out. Even though they were older and veterans of earlier campaigns in Poland and France, they were upbeat and positive about our situation. Like me, they just wanted peace and to go home to their families. Starting that first night, I ate my meals with them. Turned out they played scat, my favourite card game. We played soccer too. Other newly arrived soldiers brought stories of massive bombings of German cities, heavy casualties and destruction, as well as German retreats in Russia. Violence inside the camp escalated, especially after the failed attempt on Hitler's life on July 20th, 1944. After his near assassination, Hitler didn't trust his generals anymore. He made certain that the rest of his advisers were loyal, hardcore Nazis. He initiated many schemes to keep the Nazis in positions of power. One scheme included the Nazis abroad. Hitler issued a new order. The worldwide military salute, bent arm raised to the cap, had to be replaced by the Nazi salute, a stiff, raised right arm. Previously, only the SS had saluted that way. Hitler was able to extend his new order to POW camps. Since he knew that America respected the Geneva Convention, he sent the order regarding the military salute via the Red Cross to the American government. After that, German POWs were required to give American officers the Hitler salute. The American officers must have hated salute. The POWs who weren't Nazis hated it too. Hitler's manipulation of the Geneva Convention gave the Nazis in our camp a feeling of power and control. A remark like, Hitler is a criminal, Germany will lose the war, could get you killed in the blink of an eye by the SS. We had kept a tight lip as civilians in Germany, and now we had to shut up as POWs. More fights broke out when older men with philosophical and political views of their own spoke up. As a result, more of them had to be treated for serious injuries. It was not until the end of 1944 that the American camp commandant tried to stop the fights. He issued orders over a loudspeaker. Anyone whose life or limb is threatened by a fellow prisoner can seek protection from the guards at the gate. The meaning was clear. The Americans finally realised they could no longer depend on the German NCOs to control the POWs, who, in turn, had to face the same grim realisation. The NCOs were not nearly as powerful as the SS yet the internal administration of POW camps stayed in the hands of German NCOs. Better educated and more experienced in leadership, the logical choice should have been the German officers, but Geneva Convention rules prohibited them from performing this duty. The convention made it obligatory for the US Army camp administration to have the POWs appoint a representative or spokesman to deal with them. We were never asked to nominate candidates for this position or to vote on who should represent us. Before we even had time to offer a candidate of our choice, an aggressive, politically savvy POW 
wormed his way into the position of German camp spokesman. Although the Americans were unaware of it, that particular NCO was popular among like-thinking POWs for his stance on militarism and loyalty to Hitler. Despite this turn of events, after the American camp commander asserted his control, camp life settled down again. He saw to it that more team for recreation was offered. This gave militant Pau something to think about other than politics and war. Even enlisted men like myself were given more time for entertainment. Soccer players held championship games that were well attended. Space for a theatre attracted actors and gave them the opportunity to hone their skills to entertain the rest of us. Some of the men impersonated women and took those roles in musical shows. We laughed until our sides hurt as guys. We knew put everything they had into a performance for our benefit. Once a week, we got to see movies. We liked the Hollywood presentations far more than the German ones. A small library with books that had been banned in Germany was open to us too. For the first time, I was able to read books by Jewish authors and anti-Nazi writers and thinkers such as Mann and Nietzsche. Hitler had suppressed religion, Jewish and Christian alike. In the camp, the SS and other Nazis viewed religion as an anti-Nazi activity, but that didn't stop me from going to the chapel. My friends started coming with white-out heart-sick souls began to heal when we were given a place to practice our faith together. Catholic and Lutheran POW chaplains conducted religious services on Sunday mornings. For me, and I'm sure for others, this was a spiritual link to our families. While we were in our sanctuary, we could bow our heads and pray for the health and safety of those we had left behind. Together, we prayed for continued strength and courage to cope with our imprisonment. The chaplains advised us to stay busy by working and to not think too much. The work part was easy, since all enlisted men were required to work at full-time jobs at Fort Knox. In August of 1944, I was given a job in an excellent, practically four-star kitchen. This was the kitchen of the headquarters unit, which had a professional German restaurant chef and a professional German pastry chef. I hadn't seen meals like these in years. I translated for the mess sergeant, plus washed dishes and peeled potatoes. Since I dined like an officer, I was as satisfied with my job as I could be under the circumstances. One day, I cut myself as I was peeling vegetables. The cut was deep and bled so much that the chef sent me to a young German medic. Well-groomed handsome with brown hair and blue eyes, Wolfgang was about seven years older than I was. A medical student prior to being drafted, his social class was above my own, yet he took a long time to clean, stitch and bandage my wound as he conversed with me in an unusually familiar way. So, Heino, what kind of music do you like? Personally, I like Wagner very much, Wolfgang said as he moved behind me and began to lightly massage my back and to gently press against lightly massage haven't had much time to think about classical music, I said as I squirmed away. I became uncomfortable and turned around. He took my hand. You know, Heino, I'm in charge here. I can get you off work any time you like. Wolfgang looked at me strangely and said, All you have to do is to complain about a back pain, and then you just come straight to me as to race out the door, reeling in confusion. If Wolfgang was a homosexual, how had he escaped being persecuted in Germany? Gays were sent to concentration camps. Could it be he was so lonely for a woman that my soft boyishness was better than nothing? I never understood the full situation or what Wolfgang was feeling, because I never went back. When my wound looked like it had healed, I pulled out the stitches myself. Life in prison camp became a running series of stunning events. I had no idea one sunny Sunday morning, November 5th, 1944, when I left for work that the rest of the camp would be turned out to search for the Nazi culprits who were severely beating our fellow POWs. The American camp commander was determined to find the Nazi brutes. The Nazis had been so swift in their attacks and so cruel to informers that they had been impossible to catch. My fellow kitchen helpers and I were unaware of the surprise roll call that took place while we were at work. When I returned with some of my buddies from kitchen duty that afternoon, we were making jokes 
not realising what had occurred. Later, friends in my barracks told me that the entire camp of POWs was required to walk slowly under a balcony for identification by the victims. Unfortunately, they were unable to identify anyone. Then they told me the worst news. In the confusion, an American guard had shot to death my good friends Ernst Schlotter and Friedrich Wolf. No one could tell me exactly what happened, but later, as I read in the New York Times, November 6, 1944, the guard was described as otherwise unsuccessful in persuading the prisoners to leave the fence. The article went on to say, the guard prevented a mass escape. This had to be a total fabrication. Not even the American civilians working in Fort Knox believed this account. Everyone knew that German POWs routinely went to work every day within the military installation without guards. I did so myself. Also, that day, the POWs had been ordered to stand between the fences. This area was normally a no-man's land. A tripwire 12 inches high was approximately 8 feet in front of the first fence, between the guards and us. This tripwire could not be crossed without permission from the guards in the towers. For instance, when a soccer ball landed inside the tripwire zone, you needed permission to retrieve it or risk getting shot. During the many hours the entire camp had been ordered inside that fence line, some POWs had obviously taunted a guard. However, there was still one row of fence and barbed wire between the guard and the POWs. The guard towers had machine guns trained on the assembled prisoners. It just didn't make sense to me that Fritz and Ernst could have done anything to deserve being shot. Fifty years later, I still feel the need to set the record straight. Those men were my friends. The Americans held the funerals and burials the next day. Under the regulations of the Geneva Convention, we wore our German uniforms. The camp commander gave us a German war flag to fold on the caskets in the post chapel and to refold on the grave is while an American honor guard ferried three salvos and played taps. The American captain in charge was obviously not in agreement. To display his disdain for our military rights, the captain smoked a cigarette as he stood over the graves during the lowering of the caskets. I could not have imagined that I would visit Fritz and Ernst's graves at Fort Knox 20 years later as an American citizen. I shed tears for my friends as I remembered them. A few years ago, I visited their graves again at the invitation of local historian and writer Gary Kemp. When Gary showed me the original New York Times article about Ernst and Fritz, I think I finally understood the discrepancy between the actual event and the report. Because their deaths had to be reported to the International Red Cross, a public explanation was needed, and the news would certainly filter back to the German government. The United States had every reason to fear retaliation if the incident was not covered up, since many American POWs were being held in Germany. But this is all hindsight. At the time, I was distraught, angry and confused. After the funerals, we went back to work, ever more vigilant on all sides. We discussed the shootings among ourselves and concluded that unless the camp was turned out again to hunt for the same Nazis, we had little to fear from the American guards, but we still had plenty to worry about from the Nazis. In fact, we were so cautious that none of the English speakers in camp wanted to be the first to break the news from the New York Times. When Hitler knew that Soviet forces were closing in on him, he married his mistress, Eva Braun, before committing suicide in his bunker under the Reich's Chancellery in Berlin. He told his aide that he didn't want to be taken prisoner. Hitler's last act marked him as a truly evil man. He cut short his life to be remembered for what he perceived as the good he had done for Germany. He killed himself so that he could not be confronted by his failures. Back then, I sat on my bunk and felt my lip curl as I whispered as loud as I dared. He didn't want to be taken prisoner. He couldn't face failure. What about us? But I didn't speculate openly about the significance of this event. I could only hope that Hitler's death would bring the war to a quick conclusion. I crushed the newspaper into a little ball, stamped on it a few times, and threw it in the trash. Finally, on May 11th, 1945, the entire camp was called from our work details to an assembly 
the American camp commandant announced, Hitler is dead and Germany has surrendered. You are no longer bound by the oath you took to Hitler. Keep up the good discipline you have shown here and keep up the good work on your jobs. He validated the truth of this earth-shaking news and assured us of our security at Fort Knox at the same time. The commandant went on to explain there had been reports of shooting and killing by drunken American guards in some of the POW camps. However, he personally assured us that we were safe, adding that headquarters staff had requested our immediate return to work. Everyone was needed to keep the camp running smoothly, he concluded. Our relationships inside the camp with American military staff had been harmonious. So we went back to work as if nothing had happened. But the American commandant did not bring up the one item we longed to hear. How long are they going to keep us here? When are we going home? The questions rumbled through the camp. Most POWs felt that on the whole, we were being treated fairly by the Americans. America governed the camps democratically and took every opportunity to open our eyes to this new concept. We were told in lectures that we had been living under a dictatorship. They showed us a series of training films in which democratic principles were explained in words and by example. The difference between the German government we had known and the American one under which we were living was plain to see. To illustrate the point, we were even allowed to have our own German newsletter, written and mimeographed by the POWs. The paper not only carried a calendar of events and sports news, but poetry, short stories, technical articles, crossword puzzles, word games, and even classified ads. Individual expression had been suppressed in Germans for so long that it took a while to put our opinions down on paper and submit articles. The editor kept encouraging us to give him material. After Germany's defeat, we were encouraged to believe that it would be safe to express ourselves under the American Articles of Freedom of Speech. Although I had never written for publication, I was still rankled by the injustice of the tragic deaths of my friends, caused directly and indirectly by the Nazi POWs. Ideas started popping into my head. Most of my thoughts revolved around a plan to put the Nazis where they belonged. They should finally be identified, for our sake as well as for the Americans. Nazis should not be given the same privileges as we had, and they certainly should not be sent home at the same time as the rest of us. My first and only article for the newsletter divided Nazis into three groups. One, those who were long-time members of party organisations that had helped Hitler attain power. Two, those who followed after 1933, who benefited by membership in the party or believed in the cause. Three, we who never had a chance to vote because of our youth. Free elections had been banned after 1933. In my grief over the death of my friends and my enthusiasm to see my work published, I lost sight of the fact that freedom of expression in America might not extend to freedom of expression within a POW camp. I didn't think about a ricochet. Not until I took my article over to post headquarters and started translating it into English for my pals there. One of them told me that the German camp spokesman had asked them about me. Ach, my article must have struck a raw nerve. The NCO belonged to my number two category. Prior to Germany's surrender, he presented himself to POWs as a hardcore militant, loyal to der Führer. When Hitler killed himself and Germany was defeated, he discarded these beliefs and presented himself to the Americans as a cooperative, peaceful German ex-soldier. Like the rest of us, he wanted to go home. Getting me beat up or killed won't be worth the risk to him, I thought. Not at this late date. Since we're both incarcerated, what can he possibly do to me? Three days after the newsletter was circulated, I found out the hard way. When I turned up for duty, the sergeant told me I was no longer needed. The camp spokesman had been able to pull strings to oust me from my cushy kitchen job. I was told to report to post engineers for a road building detail. The sergeant also told me that I had also been booted out of my barrack and transferred to the branch camp we could see down the hill. I immediately knew what was up. That building housed the Axis POWs captured in France and Nazi elements. 
they had congregated there almost as quickly as they had arrived. In two swift strokes, the camp spokesman had made my life go kaput. He tore me from the camaraderie of my fellow northern Germans, the companionship of friendly kitchen helpers, and my pick of the best food served in the officer's mess. Now I was sent to bunk in the old branch camp, populated by young SS and members of the Russian Vlasov Brigade. Once again, I walked a mental tightrope, watching every move I made and every word I said. My only hope was to contact the American intelligence officer. Where was he when I needed him? Probably chowing down in my former place of employment. When I finally reached him and apprised him of the fact that I spoke terrific English and could be more useful elsewhere, it didn't change a thing. I knew that the Russians who hauled rocks were former members of the Red Army and much tougher than I. They had survived being taken prisoner by German forces and had been badly treated and ill-fed by them. I gleaned from the stories they told that one of their officers was a former Soviet, General Vlasov. After his capture by the Axis, high-level German authorities persuaded him to form an anti-communist Russian army under German command. General Vlasov agreed to the proposal with the stipulation that the new army unit would not be pitted against their former comrades on the Russian front. So, they were sent to fight the Western Allies in France. Americans captured them this time. At the end of the war, the Soviets demanded the return of the Red Army POWs. This most certainly led to their deaths or life imprisonment at more hard labour. I groaned inwardly at the thought. Hard labour. Braced for more drudgery, I hauled myself over to post engineers to see where I'd been assigned. When I walked into the building, I asked someone for directions in English. That's when I met Mr. Ashley. With a big smile, he bounced out of his open office door to talk to me, assuming as I soon found out that I was the bilingual German he had requested months before. He explained that the separation centre needed an interpreter to process the discharges of American soldiers. Why on earth would a German interpreter be needed for American soldier discharges? This became clear a little later. You're hired, Mr Ashley said. You can start right now. Thank you, I'm ready, I said, trying not to show how relieved I felt. I didn't understand what the job was yet, but I was willing to give it everything I had. I wanted to be certain that if Mr Ashley ever discovered his error, he would keep me anyway. What I soon learned was that Fort Knox had established a large separation centre for returning American GIs who served enough time overseas to be discharged. I was goggle-eyed to see that German POWs ran the complete American Army discharge process. The POWs conducted medical tests and even passed out the new Eisenhower jackets with the discharge eagerly. This was why an interpreter was needed. A keenly middle-aged civilian, Mr. H. G. Nall, supervised all the German POWs working in the centre. He turned out to be the best boss I had ever had. Mr. Nall was a gregarious, happy fellow. Since I was his only employee who spoke English, he had friendly conversations with me and joked and laughed about the workings of the camp. He gave me the English name of Henry. After a few days, he said, I trust you, Henry, and handed me the keys to his jeep. He wanted me to take over the supervision of all the work details posted throughout Fort Knox. Although I had never driven a jeep or even driven on a real road, I accepted the keys while trying to figure out how I could practice before my first day as a work detail supervisor. The next few hours were a mad scramble to find a German POW who knew how to drive a jeep. My POW grapevine turned up Willie, a thin, nervous fellow from Latvia. He promised not to tell anyone, since he thought my ruse was funny. The next morning, we sauntered into the motor pool and picked up the jeep. Willie drove it to a field out of sight. We changed places. During the next hour, Willie shouted instructions and bravely hung on. The clutch, you dunce. The reverse is upward, idiot. Stop, for God's sake. I ground gears, knocked over trees and flattened posts, frantically trying to learn how to shift and back up until Willie thought I was good enough to drive without him. No one ever knew that I had only a one-hour driving lesson when I dropped Willie off at his work detail. He gave me a funny little salute and a crooked grin, as I lurched off to my first post, shooting gravel fore and aft. 
From then on, Mr. Knoll usually worked in the office while I picked up the jeep from the motor pool and drove out to each post. After making certain that everyone was busy on his assignment, I signed the work slips for Mr. Knoll. By giving me freedom within the large military reservation, he helped me feel like a human being again. I had complete freedom inside the fort. Still, the barbed wire, just the sight of it, made me sick. On the plus side, I discovered every nook and cranny in Fort Knox, including the WAC, Women's Army Corps Mess Hall. Pure luck got me in the door. The coat rack in Mr. Knoll's office usually held army field jackets and shirts left behind by US Army personnel when the weather suddenly changed. The garments came in handy for me when the weather grew chilly. Plus, I noticed that everyone was a lot friendlier when I wore these shirts and jackets. The wax even waved to me as I drove by their mess hall. This encouraged me to go inside and try to get served. No problem. The mess hall staff treated me like any other GI, no questions asked. Lunch hour became the best part of my day. I could sit down, relax, eat good food and watch the girls go by. Mr. Knoll, being a civilian, always brought a black metal lunchbox with a matching thermos to his office. Before I ensconced myself in the whack mess hall, I had seen him eating dried up American style sandwiches made of bologna on white rubbery bread. He washed it down with lukewarm coffee. I felt sorry for him. Since he was so nice to me, I decided to share my bounty with him. He was eager to try it out and wondered why he had never thought of it himself. Yet, when I took him inside, we were immediately questioned and thrown out. Come to find out civilians were not allowed. Since they also figured out who I was, it was my last visit with the wax. On the way back to the jeep, Mr. Knoll slapped me on the back and said, Henry, you are one crazy guy. He apparently thought the whole scene hilarious. I guess that, being a civilian, he never worried about all the army rules and regulations, which is why he was always so easy going with me. Now we'll go back to the office and share my lunch. Got any change for a couple candy bars? He said, laughing. I had just lost my one perk, and he was trying to cheer me up with a candy bar. I never forgot Mr. Knoll and all the favours he did for me. About 20 years later, my wife Jean and two of our sons looked up dear old Mr. Knoll when we visited Fort Knox. The minute we drove up to his house and he spotted me, he exclaimed, Henry, I'm so glad to see you. He had been a wonderful boss, a relationship made even more special because we were able to quickly overcome national prejudices and get on with living. Mr. Knoll treated me like any other employee. He even assigned me a desk. The aged janitor, an elderly black man named Jimmy, called me Massa, to my surprise. Does he mean master? I wondered. If so, he has no clue that I'm just an average guy back home. All I knew about were the racial and class distinctions in Germany. My racial indoctrination there had not included blacks. I was totally unaware of the extent of racial divisions in America in those days, and I was curious about what men of other colours were like. We had been indoctrinated in order to instill the superiority of the northern German Nordic race and the southern German Dinaric race. True scientific racial classifications such as Negro, Mongolian and Caucasian were not taught since this would have confused Nazi hierarchy. We were instructed instead on how to identify and to regard our inferiors, some of whom were also Caucasian, Slavs and Jews, for example. Gypsies and all other races came under an inferior heading. Blacks were never mentioned, since none were living in German-held territories at that time. Although my family was middle class and Nordic, we were not privileged and didn't feel superior. It was understood from birth that neither my sister nor I would get an advanced education. We would always be middle class. To my astonishment, Jimmy cleaned the ashtray for me, of all people a lowly private and a former enemy. Jimmy didn't seem to mind. If he was hoping for social change, he didn't let on. Our lives as POWs didn't change either, even though the war was over. The worst thing about us having lost the war was not our reduced food rations in 1945. 
They were still better than what we ever had in the German army. It was the lack of letters. Right after the end of the war, we were given a card with the inscription. A former member of the defeated German armed forces is searching for his next of kin. Refusal to sign led to an automatic prohibition to send or receive mail. Men stood around, reading and rereading the card, trying to decide what to do. I'm not a Nazi, but I'm not signing this. It's an insult, I blurted out. Looking back, I see that I was still somewhat indoctrinated and way too impulsive for my own good. Yeah, the kid is right, I heard guys around me saying. Along with some of my buddies, I tore up my card in a show of disgust. I did not learn anything more about the fate of my mother, father, sister or uncle for more than a year. I was worried about my family since my hometown was a major seaport with a naval base, submarine base, shipyard and the Walther Rocket Company, which built rocket engines for various Air Force fighter planes such as the NE-163 Comet Jet. The city had been bombed since 1939. I knew from POWs arriving from France and from American newspapers that my city had been the recent target of massive air raids. What would I find when I got home? About a year after the card affair, spring of 1946, the Americans called an assembly for an important announcement. Finally, we heard what we'd been longing to hear. You can go home, boys. I ran back to my old barracks, laughing, singing, whistling, dancing up and down, and making music with anything that made a tune. We celebrated our release from captivity. We broke out the latest batch of raisin wine. All the old sailing songs from the Baltic Sea were sung that night. Soon, a ship would take us home. Some of the POWs among us were not as jubilant. Their home states had been ceded to other countries, and their families were refugees. One of them was Walter Breitkopf, who hailed from Silesia. His home had suddenly come under Polish domain, and he couldn't go back. To make matters worse, he had spent many worrisome months tracing the whereabouts of his mother and sister, who had fled as refugees. Fortunately, the Red Cross found them. They were safe in my hometown. Walter located my barrack and become a good friend. Later on, I helped him get settled in Kiel, and he helped me when I immigrated. Hopes and dreams of seeing our families again were finally coming true. We started saving our money to buy them gifts. What should I buy for my mother that will really be useful? I went around asking older men. Then we would launch into long conversations about who we wanted to see first, what we would do first, and even what stories we wanted to tell first. And we finally let ourselves think out loud about German girls. I know just the kind of girl I want, someone would say and then he would go on and on about a girl he remembered, her hair, her eyes, and her figure. They're waiting for us, boys, the older ones would say. They haven't seen men like us for ages. The banter and the excitement went on and on. Many of us were kids when we left home. Now we felt old. As for me, I turned 21 that year and realised that I should have learned more from my parents when I had the chance. My family? Were they still alive? Memories of them had given me hope, optimism, and the will to survive. I felt certain that they were living. I had fervently prayed for their survival. Mr Null had almost been a father figure to me, and Mr Ashley appreciated me. But I had to get home to help my parents, my Uncle Hanny, and my sister, Erica. Luckily, I was with the first group to leave. Yet one day, Mr. Ashley, with a worried frown, drew me aside. Henry, you don't have to leave right away if you don't want to. You're a good man. We need you here. You know we don't have enough interpreters. Mr. Ashley, I said, I can't wait any longer. It can't be soon enough for me. I told Mr. Nall the same thing. That put an end to the matter. An edict that went immediately into effect was mandatory attendance at Allied documentary films about the Nazi atrocities in the concentration camps in Poland. The Allies wanted to make certain that every German soldier knew exactly what went on during Hitler's regime. Reactions to the films were mixed. 